We're generally trying to understand if we have some kind of random process that's single dimensional, uh, what the distribution over outcomes we would expect to see in the future might look like. Right? For example, uh, the real valued example that Kevin gave was sort of understanding the distribution over temperatures uh, a single person might have over the day, or maybe a distribution over temperatures that everyone in a given city might have. Okay? Um, those problems are interesting and important, uh, but much of what we think of when we're talking about machine learning uh, is doing something different. It's doing prediction. Uh, given some input, you're trying to predict some output, okay? Uh, and we'll start uh, talking about those sorts of problems today. Uh, in particular, we'll be talking about one sort of classic example of, of making predictions uh, from inputs, okay? And that's called linear regression. So we're going to start with a really simple example. Let's think about the fact that we have a whole bunch of data about home sales in Seattle. Uh, and we know sort of the house sale prices for a whole bunch of historical sales. Uh, and we also have the information about the number of square feet for each of those houses. Right? We can think of that as training data. right? We have uh, x as an input. Uh, we have x as an input. And we can think of y as an output, right? Where we're hoping that from the number of square feet, we might be able to say something about how, uh, how much a house will sell for. Okay? Um, and we might have a bunch of data, which is represented here as a bunch of dots on, on this graph. OK. So uh, the general process that we use in machine learning, and it's something that we'll return to again and again, is this idea that we first decide on a model. Right? We then find a function which best fits the data uh, as a function of the model we've decided, uh, and then use that function to make predictions on new examples. Okay, So we'll walk through this model a couple of times during today's lecture. OK, so the model we'll start with today based on the graph of examples that we had before, was that we will assume house price is a linear function of the square feet of the house. Okay. Once we've made that decision, we want to find a linear function from our input square feet to our output, the house sale price. Uh, and we want to find the one that fits the historical data we have the best. Okay. And what do I mean by fitting the data the best? We always have to find we have to choose a loss function, right? This is a choice. Uh, and then we will use that loss function and find the linear model, the linear function, which maps from our input to our output and minimizes loss function on our data. Okay. So let's think about this on our particular example, right? We have some kind of hypothesis or model. Our assumption is that yi is about a linear function of xi. Right? And here again, we're using this approximable uh, to mean that there will be some error, but I'm saying it in sort of the loosest possible terms at the moment. Okay. Then what we want to do uh, is think about a particular loss function. right? And for today, the only loss function we're going to talk about uh, is one which is called least squares. Okay. So least squares, we'll talk about various intuitions for it. Um, but if you look at this, this term, we're looking for the minimum w, which is this linear function of square feet to sale price. Uh, and we're looking to minimize the difference between the predictions we'd make using this linear function uh, on our input data and the output labels that we have. Right? And we're looking at minimizing that difference squared, summing up over all of the data examples we have. OK, any questions so far? I guess we don't have uh, a chat, so feel free to uh, break in when I ask any questions so far. OK, all right, so we have a model. We have assumed that our data can be somewhat represented as a linear function from our input of square feet to our output of sale price. And we've decided on a loss function, right? Uh, which evaluates how well a particular W, a particular linear function, predicts outputs from inputs on our training data. Now the question is, how do we find, the next question is, how do we find the W which minimizes this loss function? Okay. 
So the way we can do that is just as Kevin was mentioning last time, we can think about taking the derivative with respect to W of this guy, right? of the sum from i equals one to n of yi minus xi w squared, right? And this- But only if the shareholder can obtain a specified price. Anna owns 100 shares. Once it reaches Whoa. the top limit is in order to sell or buy a stock once it reaches a certain level, what but is... only if the shareholder- Sorry, what was that? Did anyone else hear that? Yeah, it sounded like a YouTube video. Okay. Right. Okay. <laughs> yeah, okay. That was strange. I don't know where that came from. Okay. So if we take this derivative, right, and we do and we set this to zero, what we end up finding is that the w which minimizes this is equal to the sum of we can solve this to find a W, right? And it turns out that there's actually a really nice description of this W. Um, it's not something that's particularly complicated, right? So we can find that this is uh, taking the derivative of this, we get, sorry, my pen is not working for some reason. Okay, we get that this is equal to the sum to y i minus x i of u times, uh, okay, sorry, one second, uh, negative x i, okay. And then we can solve for w here, that if we set this equal to zero, right? Uh, then what we get is zero is equal to the sum of y i minus x i w times x i, right? Okay, so, that will then give us a nice way to describe, uh, sorry, are you guys not seeing my screen or are you? Okay, good. Okay, so that will allow us to find this function here, right? Which describes our data in a nice linear way. Um, and the error that we're looking at, what this is actually doing in some kind of geometric sense is that we're looking, do you see these nice light green lines, right? These are different epsilon i's for our different data. Uh, and we're looking to minimize the sum of the squares of all of those over our data set, right? That's exactly what we're trying to do. Okay. So we've gone through this simple process. We've found a model, right? We've decided the model we want to use is a linear model, right? We've chosen the least squares loss function. And then we've uh, actually found a function which minimizes that loss on the data, right? We picked a W which minimizes that particular loss function. So the next part of our recipe that we're going to make a whole point of doing this set of things is we want to use the simple linear function to make predictions on new examples. Okay. So now we can think about making a prediction, right? Um, we have, you know, a nice linear function, this w hat that we found from before. And what we want to do is say that there's some x new, right? We have a new house on the market and we know how much, uh, we know how many square feet it is. And we'd like to predict how much it's likely to sell for, right? So then what we say is that y new, right, is approximately equal to, the, our, the prediction we would make is equal to w hat ls times x nu. Okay. And we know there will be some variance, but uh, that's what our model says we ought to predict. Okay. Okay. So, um, sorry about that. It's extra slides here. Okay. Great. So now I think we want to go through this, uh, not just thinking about square footage, because we all know that square footage is going to be a pretty imperfect approximation uh, of, of the total set of things that actually define how much a house is going to sell for, right? Instead, let's think about uh, that we might actually have many different features or many different properties of a house that, that are actually going to 
determine the house price, right? Presumably the zip code, the date of the sale, the number of bedrooms, the number of bathrooms, uh, the number of car garages, all of these sorts of things are actually going to impact uh, the house sale price that we're trying to predict, right? And if we have more of those inputs, uh, the hope is that we'll be able to predict a better estimate of the house sale price for all of these different houses, right? So now, uh, the only thing that has changed here, well, there are a couple of small things, is that we're now assuming that our training data lies in RD rather than R, right? So we're thinking of XI as a vector rather than a number, okay? Uh, we're still thinking of the sale price as a single real number, right? That makes sense. Uh, and we're still thinking about linear hypotheses. But now, because uh, we have D different features, D different example, or D different pieces of information about each of our examples, uh, we're going to think about a linear function of all of those D different features, right? Which means we'll think about X as a vector, W also as a vector. And so to figure out what our linear hypothesis is, we'll take xi transpose uh, uh, w. And that's the same, uh, the same, we'll use the same loss function as before. Okay, okay. so uh, if we look at the same example, right, uh, we might want to understand, right, what the error of our model looks like, right? And that's just the remaining amount, uh, you know, if we look at the sale price of a bunch of different houses um, and we consider what some linear model says the house price should be, there will still be some error for many, if not most of the houses, and we'll represent those as epsilon i's. Does anybody have any questions right here, since we can't uh, directly answer questions in chat? Uh, I have a question. Great. Um, so suppose that we want to have a constant in here, like maybe, you know, things work better if no matter what, you know, just a house is going to sell for at least, you know, a hundred bucks or something. We'll, we'll get to that. Yeah. Right. Um, and, and my, my joking example is that like, there's probably no house in mainland Seattle that sells for less than $300,000 if it, you know, is standing I mean, and has at least a certain amount of land and something like this, right? You know, that, that's entirely fair. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, we'll, we'll get to that in a bit. Um, yeah, that's definitely part of the lecture that we'll get to. Anything else? Um, yeah. I also had a question. Yeah, um, so before, like, when you said you found the estimate, you said, like, so there's gonna be some variance, but we're okay, like, so variance in what? What did you mean though when you said there's some variance? Uh, what I, I meant that. was, that mm -hmm. uh, if you try to predict sales price from square footage, you won't exactly, you won't do a perfect job predicting uh, the sale price sure. from the square footage. That's what I meant. I wasn't saying anything formal when I used the word variance. Got you. Okay. Yeah. Anybody else? Uh, I, I have a question. Great. Thank you. Uh, for, for, for the features like you, you, you list here, the zip code, the date of sale, uh, one question is that some features that you listed here, it's not comparable. And, uh, but, but when we're training, we need, to, we, we need a feature factor. This is one question. Another question is that uh, how, we de how we justify our selection of features, like uh, why the zip code, why we choose zip code, and uh, how important the zip code plays plays the role in the prediction and uh, yeah, that's my second question. Absolutely, great. So the first question was, you know, zip code and date of sale, those are weird features from the perspective of thinking about all of these things as real values, right? Zip codes certainly aren't real valued. They're usually uh, five digits or maybe now they're nine digits. I think that's the right number, five or nine. Yeah, okay. Um, and so, that's not something that would obviously uh, translate well into using some kind of uh, real valued linear coefficient uh, to describe the importance of zip code, right? And similarly, date of sale is not something that you would think that like there's a nice linear function, you know, it depends upon how precisely you represent those features, uh, how well you'd be able uh, to use them when thinking about a linear model. So when I say that X is actually equal to all of these things, I really mean that we've thought of some fancy encoding for these, 
right? So zip code, for example, um, you know, I, I don't want to talk too, in too much detail about this, um, but date of sale, for example, you could just think about this being represented as uh, a month feature and a day feature, right? And those might be the relevant attributes. And maybe as a function of those, you could do a better job describing them. Um, as far as zip code is concerned, zip code is a more complicated thing. Um, so so I, uh, maybe I'll leave that to, uh, we can discuss that offline after the class. Um, but the other question, is how we choose the features that we use is a very valid one, right? So, you know, date of sale, number of bathrooms, square footage, all of these different things. Uh, you might ask why we thought we should put those there, right? Why should we be using those try to try and predict sale price? Right? Uh, and this is a really interesting and important question, right? Feature selection is a really difficult task, right? Trying to decide which features are relevant to our prediction problem. Uh, you know, we might have some understanding that there's some correlation or anti-correlation for each of these features separately. Uh, and as a basic heuristic, we might just say, okay, we're going to think of 10 features that we have observed having some correlation uh, with sale price. And we'll try to use a linear model as a function of all of those to predict sales price. Right? There are fancier ways to do that, um, but that's the simplest way to think about this for today. Right? That you're just picking features that you have observed based on historical data having some correlation uh, with the thing you're trying to predict. But that's a very good question and that's not necessarily the best way to do things. Um, and we'll talk more about that later in the class. Okay. Yeah, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, professor, a uh, very quick one. Are you using the same slides from website or you're using a different one? Uh, I just updated them, I believe, uh, just before class. Um, and I apologize if they don't look the same. Uh, I, I tried to update them about 10 minutes before lecture. Okay. Other questions? Okay, good. Okay, so I'm going to, the reason I introduced this in one dimension, which is, you know, maybe a little bit more trivial than most of you need as an introduction, is that I'm now going to introduce uh, the same problem, but use matrix notation. Uh, and generally, this is a point where we need some extra time. So I want to be very explicit in terms of uh, precisely what vectors we're using. Okay, so the problem we're thinking about now is that we have a bunch of sales prices, right? Historical sale prices, and a bunch of examples of different homes, right? And each of these looks like a vector of examples or data points, right? And the entire matrix X looks just like I apologize, the full screen mode is a bunch of different examples of our different, uh, our different data points, which have square footage, uh, whatever encoding we've decided for zip code, whatever encoding we've decided for date of sale, the number of bedrooms, the number of bathrooms, perhaps what school district they're in, things like this. Oh, for some reason, Zoom decided to kick me out of Apologies, guys. I'm not sure why that happened. Okay. Okay. So we normally use uh, the number n or the letter n to represent the number of examples or data points we have. Uh, and D. Uh, two slides. Oh, okay. Sorry. No worries. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, um, Zoom is misbehaving today. Okay, so we usually use n to represent the number of examples or data points that we have, right? So we have, you know, maybe the hundred most recent homes sold in Seattle, uh, and d to represent the number of features. Okay, um, then we're looking for uh, we're looking for some linear function which does a pretty good job mapping from the set of features we have on the data we have to the sales prices that we, we have observed. Right? And we understand as before, 
this won't be a perfect function, either of our training data uh, or of future data that we see, right? So when this approximate, you know, our use of approximate here is just saying that there will be some error, which will be different uh, for many of our different data points. Uh, professor, uh, yep. so I have a quick question. So the features X1 through Xn, are they scalars or vectors? It's X1 through Xd. So, so, um, yeah, so, so each of these X T I's for I in N, right? This guy lives in RD. So each X T I represents a house and the house is represented by D scalars, right? Okay. Uh, which we can think about as a single vector in D dimensions. Okay. Good. Thank Great. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Okay. Okay, so if we're just going to write down what this looks like in matrix notation, right? Matrix notation uh, so far just means bold letters, right? So rather than uh, little yi, we think of capital Y, which represents all of our yi's put together in a column. Uh, and we then think about capital X is just the matrix, is just the matrix of all of our X, T1 through XTN, right? These are just all of the examples of houses with all these features stacked on top of each other so that we now have a matrix, okay? And the epsilon is also bold, although uh, LaTeX does a poor job uh, with bold for, for certain Greek characters. Okay, so let's go back to our recipe, the recipe that we've talked about for how we should do uh, prediction in machine learning. Right? We should decide on a model, right? And as before, we're thinking about a linear model, right? But we're now thinking about a linear model in D dimensions. And as the previous, as a previous question uh, alluded to, right? Tacit in our decision of a model, it's not just that we're deciding on a linear model. We're actually deciding on a linear model in a particular set of D dimensions, right? The ones we're deciding that we're going to try to predict sale price from the set of D dimensions that we have gathered and we have in our data set. Okay. Now we're going to go back to the next part of our recipe. And the goal now is to look at the same loss function, right? I promised you we would only talk about one loss function today, which again is the same least squares. What we're trying to do is minimize the sum of the squared residuals between what our model predicts on our data uh, and what we actually see as the sale price, okay? So, uh, and then we have to go through picking a function which actually minimizes that loss, okay? All right. So I'm now just giving you the same visual as we had before, right, that we have, uh, but I'm again using these bold matrix notation uh, letters, right? We now have a bunch of sale prices stacked on top of each other uh, and a bunch of feature vectors stacked on top of each other, one row of that matrix X for each of our different houses. Okay, so if we want to now talk about uh, if we now want to do uh, the thing that we would probably hope in most of these cases, which is that we want to, uh, we want to actually find, uh, we want to find the linear function, which actually minimizes this loss. Right? We want to do this optimization, right? What's our first step? Somebody want to break in and remind me what our first step usually is when we're trying to minimize something? Take the derivative. Yeah, let's take the derivative with respect to? Uh, w. Great. Of this guy, right, is equal to what? All right, so we're going to have a sum again, right? And the shell tells us All right, so if we look at this in matrix notation, sorry, I'm having some screen problems on my side, one moment. Okay. Uh, okay, 
So if we write this just in matrix notation, this is, uh, we, can, we can describe this this way. Okay. And sorry, my screen seems to be frozen. So if we take the derivative with respect to this, what we get is equal to the sum over i of two yi minus xi transpose w negative x transpose i, okay? And if we wanna set that to zero, right? And solve, uh, what we see is we can cancel this too. And what we get is the sum over i of yi xi transpose uh, minus xi transpose squared w, okay? So then if we want to actually solve that, right, we can write this in matrix notation that this is equal to or we can write this all in matrix notation if we want to, and we can write it as zero is equal to uh, x negative x transpose y minus xw, okay? So then that just looks like x transpose y is equal to x transpose X W. Okay. Are you guys still able to see my screen? I apologize that I'm not on the right slide. Okay. Okay. So then the question is, how do we solve for W? Right. We're pretty close at this point. Uh, we have W on just one side of our equation, um, and the answer is, if X transpose X is vertical, right? Then we can write W as x transpose x inverse times x transpose y. Okay, does anybody know when x transpose x will be invertible? A sufficient condition? Full yes. column rank. Yeah, full column rank, right? If it's full rank. Good. Anybody else? Yeah. Okay. So, right. what we've just shown is that if what we're looking at is this least squared objective, uh, and we take the derivative with respect to w and minimize, uh, then we can actually describe the least squares estimator, right, this linear function of d dimensions, as a function of our data in a really nice way, assuming we have full column rank, right? Another description of full column rank in this example is, okay, so we have d dimensions, right? Um, and we certainly need at least d, right? We can't have a full ring uh, x transpose x if we don't have at least d houses. Right? Although that's sufficient, right? That's definitely necessary. Uh, um, okay. Jamie, yeah. could you repeat the mm -hmm. previous part, uh, what you just talked about? Because your uh, internet, it's a little poor, so we didn't hear very clearly. Sure, one second. Let me actually switch. Uh, I have several networks at home, so let me. I see. Can I ask a question? Um, it's like it's like Lenard's question, I guess. Yeah. Um, so 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 yeah. So x transpose x is invertible. So it, when it has full rank. So one. So what can we? So then, um, what do we need for x itself? 
um, for X transpose X to be invertible. So one thing was like, we need at least the number of houses. What else do we need? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, for X transpose X to be uh, invertible, you basically need, uh, you need X to be full column rank. So what is okay. sufficient for that to happen? Um, if you have any D houses that are linearly independent, that is sufficient condition uh, for okay. X transpose X to be um, full rank. Um, we'll also see that uh, when we when we talk about SVD uh, later in the quarter, uh, that'll be a, it'll be very sort of clear um, what these conditions are and the difference between just being full rank and being nearly full rank, um, because you can have basically be like almost full rank but not quite there, um, and so mm -hmm. it's kind of a gray area, and we'll we'll quantify that in very precise ways later in the quarter. Gotcha. But for Thank now. For the first week or two, we're just going to take uh, X trans X to be invertible um, and and well conditioned um, in the sense that it okay uh, yeah if you on a computer it will be fine. No, when you say full rank, you mean like every single column of the matrix has a pivot. Uh, by full rank, I mean that uh, for okay, so X transpose X is uh, it's a square matrix. That means for any square matrix, that means that it's eigenvalues are real valued mm -hmm. um, and that its uh, eigenvectors are unique. Uh, and so what that means is that it has uh, D non-zero eigenvalues. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's what I mean by it being full rank. Okay. Uh, and in the case of uh, X, the uh, matrix X, a non-square matrix X being full rank, it means that it has uh, at least D linearly independent um, rows. So like the, if you take any, so there exists some uh, D rows of X such that those, if, if I were to look each row as a different vector, each vector is, uh, that those set of vectors are linearly independent. Are the columns the vectors? The columns of vectors and the rows are vectors because X is a matrix. And so we can think of them uh, we get, we can we can go back and forth. So there's there's column rank and there's row rank. Um, yeah. But I'll let, I'll let, uh, James like, take. Sorry, apologies that uh, I have never had internet problems at my home before, uh, and I actually managed to be perfectly connected when Kevin was doing this. So apologies, I don't know exactly what's going on. Uh, I have business grade uh, internet at home. I guess everyone else is working from home too. Okay, so uh, as we were talking about, right? Uh, if we think about X, right? Uh, what we're looking at is an N dimensional uh, or an N by D matrix, right? Uh, and N in particular is the number of houses we have examples for and D is the number uh, of, of vector, uh, sorry, D is the number of features, right? And we need that X transpose X has at least D linearly independent rows uh, for this inversion to be possible. Okay. okay, so something that's pretty nice about what we've done so far, right, is that there's actually a really elegant closed form solution that we've just found for this linear function of the D dimensions that we were looking at before. Right, uh, square footage and zip code, or some encoding of zip code, the number of rooms, uh, maybe the sales price. Right, uh, the thing which minimizes this loss can be written down analytically. Right, um, we don't have to do something more complicated to try to find it uh, than just taking a derivative and actually solving exactly for w. Right, an exact solution of w can be written down just in terms uh, of our training data. That's often not true. Uh, and so, you know, there will be many cases where we have to do something more complicated to find the minimizer or approximate minimizer of the loss function we look at. Uh, but for least squares, for linear functions, we can find this really nice, elegant closed form solution. Okay. Any other questions there? Um, what's, what's the notation you have at the top? Is that the L2 norm or some kind of norm? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Anybody else? Uh, I have a quick question about what happens to the uh, XIs in the sum when you're just up a slide when you're deriving this X transpose X. 
Uh, maybe up one more slide. I'm sorry. One more. It's like yeah, it's like where the sum is. Okay. Uh, right. So, so this you have is the a... sex, uh, transpose. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so um, I think from here to here is not like a direct translation. I went back from here to here, um, and I'm happy to uh, write this out a little bit more cleanly after the lecture because I know it's pretty messy. Okay. So I have a brief question. Yeah, great. Why why the emphasis on x needs to have d linearly independent rows? Isn't it equivalent to say that x has d like that all of its columns are linearly independent? It seems that you emphasize the rows in that statement. Okay. So uh I think uh I want to talk a little bit as, as Kevin said, right? Like, uh, so, so we definitely need, let's see, I'm just doing the math in my head. So, so if we have D linearly independent rows, that's efficient. If the columns are linearly independent, uh, I guess the question is whether N and what is the relationship between N and D, right? So, uh, I, I guess thought if, it's, they're N, equivalent. N has to be at least D, uh, and yes, they will be equivalent if N is at least D. Yeah. Great. Okay. Right. Yeah. Right. So, so uh, a general rule of thumb, <laughs> and and you would get numer you would get like exceptions thrown at you if you tried to do this is you shouldn't be doing regression linear regression uh, in d dimensions if you don't have at least d examples, right? Because you won't even you definitely won't have uh, d linearly independent columns or rows in that case. Okay? Thank you very much. Yeah. All right, great. So as somebody asked before, right, how do we deal with an offset, right? So uh, we have this really nice closed form, but if you think about, uh, I'm, I've just shifted the example that you we were looking at before up by some amount, right? Uh, but in general in Seattle, right, if we're talking about like maybe Northeast Seattle and we're thinking about below 125th Street or something like that. Uh, the probability that you find a house that sells for less than $300,000, assuming it's on at least one square lot, uh, is essentially zero, right? Um, and that doesn't seem to depend on the square footage of the house, right? An empty lot would also be quite expensive. Um, you know, it would cost it some amount of the land, so a particular lot uh, is, is fixed, right? Um, or not necessarily fixed, but it's like some amount uh, that sort of is a lower bound on how much we ever see a house uh, in this part of Seattle self work. Okay, uh, so in that case, right, how would we actually deal with such a thing, right? We don't just want to think about our model being linear as a function of w. We want to think about y i now being equal to x t i w plus beta, or sorry, plus b plus epsilon i. Right? We're thinking about there being some little number b or some number b uh, a scalar that actually represents sort of a lower bound on the price that we ever see a house sell for uh, and then thinking of a linear function on top of that good okay so then if we're thinking about the optimization if we don't sort of already have in mind what the lower bound on the house on the sale price of houses are but we're trying to find that number separately right we then might want to do optimization we did before, but taking into account that there is some e, which is sort of offset that isn't taking that our uh, efficient account of. Okay. okay. If we have matrix notation, right? That's just right, we just have the same the same expression that we had before. Uh, we've added sort of this B to each of the each of the predictions we're making, right? The prediction we're making for each of our examples, right? X I plus W plus B is the predicted sales price thing for house X. Uh, and it's just different in terms of adding B. Okay. So is the is the one in front of the B just a matrix with all ones in it?
Not sure if Jamie dropped. Uh, the major, the, the one indicates a vector of one. So X is an N by D matrix. W is a D by one vector. So X times W is an N by one vector. Y is an N by one vector. B is a scalar. So the vector of ones is just a, a vector of all n's, uh, sorry, a, a vector of n ones. So B times this vector of all ones is just a vector of size n with a value B um, in every component. Yep. Uh, um, I, have, I have a question about that. Uh, uh, so uh, why, I guess, is it, does it make sense to maybe like have like the bias, like a different bias in each direction maybe? Like um, why like the same bias in every direction, every component? So that's not in every direction. Uh, that's simply uh, adding B to each of the, each of the predictions of sale price, right? So, so this isn't changing the prediction we're making in each of the D dimensions. It's just changing that we're adding B to each of the right. N different of examples. Sorry, that was a dumb question. Sorry. Yeah. Good. Okay. And really apologies for the internet. Uh, I've never seen it work so poorly. So uh, anyway. All right. Okay. So then we would just want to do the same optimization we did again. Um, and what we would find, right, if we write this in terms of, uh, if we write the same thing in terms of matrix notation, is that we get this nice term here, right? And if we just, if X transpose is invertible, right, we can simply multiply by X transpose inverse everywhere. And then we get this nice term, which is getting closer and closer, again, as we talked about, uh, to being able to say something explicit about our least squares estimator for our linear coefficients as well as our offset. If X transpose one is equal to zero, right? That will also mean one transpose X is equal to zero which would then mean this entire term goes away, right? And that's also equivalent to asking if each feature is mean zero, right? So if the average, this wouldn't make sense in, in the particular example we're talking about now, right? The square foot, the average square footage of a house we're looking at will not be zero. The average zip code will not be zero. The average uh, number of bathrooms will not be zero, uh, but there's a nice translation you can actually make to, to ensure that is the case. Um, but if it were the case that X transpose one is equal to zero, then we have a really nice term for B, right? Um, then we can say uh, that our least squares coefficients are the same as before. And because this thing is equal to zero, then we have a nice description of uh, our offset as well, okay? So uh, it's usually not going to be the case as we were talking about just in, in this example, it won't usually be the case that your original description of all your features, uh, that each one is mean zero, or in fact, that any is mean zero, right? Um, but it's a nice exercise to think about how you could translate the problem we're currently thinking about into one where each feature is mean zero and how you do the same process that we were talking about before, right? So you can certainly think about the mean value of each of your features and you can think about subtracting that mean value from each of the feature examples you have, uh, right? You can, you can think about a nice way to turn each of these to having mean zero, but then that will change the precise way you make predictions in the future, right? Um, this is a way to think about representing your features as we were talking about before. There are various manipulations that'll be useful to do to your features, either in terms of you know, representing zip codes in some meaningful way that would actually make sense to take a linear function of, uh, or you know, if you wanna think about each of your features having mean zero, uh, there's a nice translation you can do to actually make that be the case, okay? Um, because if you do that, then you get a really nice closed form and clean solution 
uh, for what both your linear coefficients and your offset will look like as a function of your training data. Uh, I have a quick question. Could yeah. you theoretically change these mean zeros by um, representing each uh, representing each input value as a normalized, standardized, like normal distribution with mean zero and standard deviation of something at some point? Uh, so I think I, I maybe don't totally understand your question, uh, but let me try to rephrase and see if see if it makes sense. Okay. So we so far haven't said anything about where we're assuming our data is coming from other than it's historical data, right? Uh, and I think what you're saying is uh, maybe if we hypothesize put it into our model, that we assume that the values of the features we're seeing are drawn from some normal distribution. Then expectation, right? If they're drawn from a normal distribution with mean zero, then in expectation they should have, you know, the feature values that we see in our particular, uh, in our particular training data should have mean zero. But they won't exactly, right? That will only be approximately true. Uh, so, so, and we haven't specified where we're assuming. We haven't decided that there's any particular model that we're married to in terms of where our feature values come from. We're sort of assuming they come from the world and they might have arbitrary distribution and we really don't know. Uh, we don't know that they're normal, normally distributed or mean zero or anything like that. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay, great. Okay, so the one thing we haven't talked about yet, uh, which I think we can go through rather quickly, is that we have some, uh, you know, we now have a model. We have some nice least squares coefficients and offset. And if we see a new house is about to be listed, uh, how should we predict how much it's going to sell for? And the answer is just as before, right? We think about the least squares estimators as linear coefficients. We think about our representation of the house, right? The house, uh, the new house, and we think about x nu as just some nice column, sorry, some nice row, uh, and w hat ls also as some row. So we then need to take the transpose of x uh, to figure out what our linear prediction is, and we add this offset that we predicted or that we've that we've um, that we've learned. All right, so, uh, so far we haven't said anything about why we chose the particular loss function that we chose, right? I just said, okay, we're going to choose the model that we're thinking about some linear function in these particular D dimensions. Uh, and then we're going to look at least squares loss, right? We're going to look at trying to minimize this difference between uh, uh, the true sale value and the predicted sale value squared summed up over all of the different training examples we have, right? And where did this loss function come from, right? Okay. Sorry, did someone say something? Can people hear me? Yes, I can hear okay. you. Loud and clear. Okay, great. Okay. So why is least squares a good loss function or where did it come from to begin with? Okay. So let's think, and this is not quite uh, getting to the, the, the question that uh, I think Ariel asked just a minute ago, um, but it is a question of sort of some more modeling about where we assume our data might be coming from, right? Previously we said, okay, we're going to assume that uh, our y's are a function of our x's, a linear function of our x's, uh, and that's the assumption we're making, but we're not making any other assumptions distributionally, or at least so far we weren't, okay? If we instead, if we give ourselves another piece of information in our modeling, and we actually assume that our you know, noise or error, right? We have different words for this particular term, but like the amount of unexplainable uh, change in sale price that our particular model doesn't, doesn't explain, right? Where do we assume that comes from, right? 
previously we sort of just assumed we, we didn't know anything about it, right? We didn't have any assumption in our model about what that epsilon i looked like. If instead we add the, the assumption that these epsilons are normally distributed, right? Namely that a sale price is actually equal to this nice linear function of xi and that there is the, the only variation from that uh, sale price that would be predicted uh, is a nice normally distributed bit of information. Okay, so that's definitely something somewhat different uh, than what we were talking about before. Uh, but that then means that yi is distributed normally, right? With mean x transpose iw, right? and variance sigma squared. Right? Does that make sense? Okay. Good. Any question? Can you? Yeah. Can you further explain how you made that connection? Uh, it's un it's unclear to me. Yeah. Sure. Okay. So if we think about y i. Yi is a random variable that's equal to this sum, right? X transpose iw is not a random variable. It's just a constant. Okay? Epsilon i is a random variable, right? And if you think about, uh, if we have a plus some random variable r, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and r, is, is distributed like a normal, right? Then the variable y is distributed normally with mean x plus a y, right? This is a property of uh, this is a property of normally distributed random variables. If you add a constant to them, right? Right. Then that resulting thing uh, is just normally distributed with a shifted mean over by that. Cool, yeah, okay. makes sense, thank you. Yeah, okay. So if we now know, right, this is not making an assumption uh, about where the values of our xi's are, or sorry, our xij's, right, where our feature values are coming from, right, which would be a further assumption we could make in our model if we wanted. Uh, like Ariel was mentioning before, that might be an interesting thing to pursue. Uh, we're just thinking about sort of an explanation of where our errors come from and precisely what they look like, right? We're making a very strong assumption that they have mean zero and that they are normally distributed and independent across each of our different examples. Okay, great. Okay, so that would then mean if we think about, like we talked about last week, if we wanted to maximize the log likelihood that we were talking about uh, last week, right? Uh, which means we want to think about the probability of the data given w that we know and sigma, right? Uh, and then take the log of that, right? Then we just get this nice term, right? And this just looks like the uh, density function of, uh, of the normal distribution with mean x transpose i uh, w. Okay. So what that means, uh, okay, is that if we want to actually take, if we want to actually minimize this thing, right? What we did last time when we thought about, or sorry, maximize this thing, we thought about maximizing the log likelihood of some data, right? And one second, okay, right? The way we would do that is we'd take the derivative, right? Uh, and if we take the derivative with respect to W of this guy, right? First thing we should do actually is we should use this nice log that we have and understand that when we take a log, right, a product becomes a sum. So that we then get one over two pi sigma to the n type uh, plus, right, this whole guy, the sum of the uh, 
Sorry about that. Oh, sh shouldn't that be n times? Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Sorry, guys. N times this. Uh, uh, times the log mine. of that, right? Yeah. Sorry, guys. N times the log of one over of square root two pi sigma, right? Uh, plus negative y i uh, minus x i transpose w squared over two sigma squared. And this needs to, we need a sum here over i, okay? Uh, and if we wanna maximize this, if we wanna maximize this particular thing, right? What we should do is we should take the derivative with respect to w, Right. And or we can just think about maximizing this, right? Which if we're maximizing with respect to W, this term is inconsequential because it doesn't have a W in it. So then we maximize with respect to W the negative sum over I of YI minus XI transpose W squared over two sigma squared. That term doesn't matter, right? And maximizing a negative is the same as minimizing a positive. And now what we see is if what we are thinking about is maximizing the log likelihood, given our data, assuming that our noise is normally distributed, and our data is actually a linear function of these d uh, dimensions we have, the way you maximize the log likelihood uh, is to actually solve uh, the least squares problem that we were talking about before, right? So this is the reason, or a reason, you might want to think about uh, the least squares loss function, right? It is a nice description of uh, maximizing the log likelihood if you assume your noise is normal. Questions about that? Uh, where did the e go when you did the when you um changed the product? Oh, sorry, I, I might have lost it. Uh, so if I take log, if I don't take log, but I actually take log ln, right? Then ln e becomes one. Okay. Yeah. Uh, can I ask a question? Yeah. So how can we interpret the estimated parameter values when the density that we assumed about the error term is not the actual data generating error uh, density? So uh, that's a good question. <laughs> uh, the error term, if we don't actually assume our error is normally distributed, there are several different ways we can interpret the errors we're making, right? Uh, and that's related to what I'm going to talk about next. Um, but informally, if we have errors, right, if our model doesn't perfectly predict uh, home sale price from the D dimensions we're looking at, that can be a, that can be a signal that we either don't have enough, we don't have enough different features, or maybe we're using extraneous features, or it might be the case that uh, we don't actually have a linear, uh, we don't actually have uh, using a linear function of d dimensions is not sufficient to predict house price, right? Or it could be the case that uh, the errors we're making are just not normally distributed or are not independent across houses, right? Uh, there might be some, there, there definitely are a variety of different reasons why our noise might not be normally distributed and it can indicate one of any number of different things. Thank you. Yeah. I have another question. Uh... Yeah. So, uh, so like, I guess in here, I'm so like looking at, at like the minimization procedure, like it doesn't seem like, so, so it, it seems like what matters is the fact that you assume your, eps, your epsilons are normally distributed with mean zero, but like the standard deviation doesn't really come into play here. That's right. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. So, so it doesn't really come into play here, uh, but that doesn't mean, you know, sort of, that's it, in short. For, for, for understanding why you might want to use the least squares procedure, uh, 
that's not particularly important, right? The the variance doesn't have have much to do with this optimization we're doing. Yeah. Okay. I have a follow-up question with the distribution. So if we assume like the error is like a normally distributed, we just like basically assume like the mean is zero. And in terms of sigma square, like the variance, is there like a, I don't know, size for that? Or just a, like, I don't know, just curious. Uh, yeah, so, so, and this isn't exactly, so, so one simple answer is that you could, if you believed your noise was normally distributed, but you didn't understand what, or you didn't know what you, your expected variance was, it's conceivable you could try to predict that from your training data. Uh, and we'll probably talk about how to do things like that later in the class. Uh, that's kind of beyond the scope of this lecture, but you could imagine, right, taking all the predictions you have, uh, looking at the difference between the predictions and the actual sales prices, right? And that gives you a sum of, of a, a vector of epsilons. And you could think about sort of, you know, the maximum likelihood estimator of the variance uh, given given the data that you have, right? If you assumed that that was not really distributed. Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah. I have another question about the distribution of the uh, of the error. Yeah. So why why do we want to assume that the mean is zero? Because uh, in, in the linear model, there's there's no constant term. If there is one, then you can absorb that mean. And otherwise, I don't see why we want to assume it's zero. For sure. So uh, for ease of notation, I dropped the additional like offset term. But really, I think you would want to think about this like you kind of always have an offset term, right? Uh, and so what I mean by this is actually that we have, you know, a B here, right? That we actually have a B in all of our terms, right? And if we actually have a B in all of our terms, uh, then it might be reasonable to assume that the noise is mean zero, right? If we've actually subtracted off this offset to begin with. Yes, thank you. Great. Any other a, questions? Yeah, yeah I have okay. another. So, it says that we're supposed to maximize the log likelihood. And does that, that gives us the same as just maximizing the likelihood? Yeah, that's right. So maximizing, so because log, uh, the log function is monotone increasing, maximizing the log of something is the same as maximizing uh, that thing. And so uh, there are a couple, there are a couple of reasons we do that, right? And as Kevin said in his last lecture, right, it's usually notationally convenient. Certainly when we're thinking about like big, ugly products like this, right? Because products become sums. Uh, so that's very nice. Um, on the other, there's, there's yet another reason to think about this, which like perhaps for some of your homeworks, this will be a useful hint. Uh, when you're actually implementing things, right? Lots of the terms you're going to be looking at are gonna be pretty small. Uh, and, and there are times when thinking about sums rather than product uh, will be, numerically better, right? Uh, because multiplying together a bunch of small numbers as opposed to adding a bunch of small numbers, you get very different uh, behavior in terms of like over and underflow and estimation errors in terms of the way numbers are represented in computers, right? So. So, so log likelihood is always a technique to find maximizing the likelihood. It's not ever its own conceptual thing. I would have to think about that a little bit more. I wouldn't want to say it's never its own conceptual thing, uh, but it is equivalent, right? In this case, maximizing log likelihood is, is equivalent to maximizing likelihood, right? Because it's a monotone function. Okay. I'm just wondering if there's like a non-convex problem set where the log likelihood is like a, like qualitatively gives a different answer or something like that. I don't think so, uh, but I, I wanna like think about it a little bit offline, I'm not sure. Okay, cool. Yeah, cool. Okay, so we're pretty close to out of time, uh, but we'll talk for another couple of minutes, right? Um, so, okay. So our historical, you know, our example previously uh, we sort of assumed or we saw based on our data that 
the regression problem we were solving uh, was actually reasonably solvable by a linear model, right? We saw, you know, at least by this sort of cartoon picture that I gave you, uh, that the number of square feet uh, roughly correlated with sales price in a nice, reasonably linear way. Which is to say, you know, if you look at the loss of the least squares estimator that you find, it's reasonably small, right? On the other hand, there are plenty of examples where that won't be the case, right? Uh, what we might see, uh, maybe we don't have the number of square feet, but instead we have something like the date of sale in Seattle. Uh, and if we try to find the best linear fit as a function of date of sale to sale price, we might notice that that, you know, both by visual inspection and by looking at the loss function that we actually incurred, the loss we actually incurred, that the best linear function uh, of the examples we see uh, is really quite poor, right? It's not a good representation of a function from the date of sale to sale price. We have a lot of error in doing that prediction. Mm -hmm. So there are several reasons, as I mentioned briefly before, right? So this is one example uh, where you might notice that your error is not normally distributed, it's not mean zero, uh, and it seems to be a function of the date of sale. Right? So that's, those are all different examples why our epsilon i, in this case, wouldn't be normally distributed with mean zero. So what this is suggesting is one of a couple things. Right? It might be the case that the date of sale simply doesn't predict price well. Right? Um, and in that case, right, if you were thinking about this, again, cartoon two-dimensional plot, what that would look like is basically a random smattering of points, right? And we don't see quite a random smattering of points, smattering, scatter of points uh, in our particular example here, right? Instead, what we see is that there are points that are, you know, have a nice rainbow shape, right? which is suggesting that there might be some representation or some function from date of sale to sale price. It doesn't seem totally random. There seems to be some correlation, but that correlation doesn't seem to be linear in nature. So if we go back to our recipe for thinking about how to do prediction, right, what we generally want to start with again is deciding on a model which previously we thought of uh, thinking about just a linear model, right? Um, and now we want to think about maybe some other kind of polynomial or other nice set of functions, right? In this first example, we'll talk about quadratic, right? So now we're going to say, all right, we're throwing linear models at least partially at the window. They don't seem to be a good fit for our data from our particular feature to our particular or a set of features to the prediction we're trying to make on house sale prices. Uh, instead, we're going to think about quadratic functions from, from date of sale to price. Okay. okay. So then what we might be looking to do is predict sale price from date of sale with a quadratic function, right? Okay. The next part of our recipe is that we still, you know, we have our model or our hypothesis, uh, but what does it mean to find the best quadratic fit, right? Best linear fit, we previously said, okay, what we want is the model that minimizes our residual, our residual error squared, right? Um, and, and we'll talk about in just a second, uh, maybe we'll actually talk about tomorrow, but we can say that the loss function we want is actually, we can still think about least squares, right? We can still minimize over the Ws we have, the sum of Yi minus, uh, Um, in this case, we have this term here, right? The sum over j equals one to d of x i j w j i, right? Plus x i j squared w j two. Right? So, and we can square that. 
right? So we can still think about uh, least squares error. And apologies, I'll clean these up a bit after class, right? We can still think about uh, least squares error when we're thinking about quadratic functions, right? It looks the same. We're just looking at uh, the prediction we make and we're subtracting the prediction we make from the sale, we, sale price we saw, squaring it and summing it over all our examples, right? That still makes sense here. Okay, so we're out of time. Uh, so on Wednesday, we'll pick up talking about sort of quadratic and polynomial regression, uh, which gives us like a stronger set of models to model the relationship between the features we have and the thing we're trying to predict. All right, thanks everyone. And I'll stick around for questions. Thank you. Uh, I got I got a quick question about this yeah. hypothesis that you have this equation with the sum of uh, j uh, up to d of x i j w j. Mm -hmm. I, mm -hmm. Could you just briefly explain that? Um, just in general, I didn't quite understand it. Yeah, sure. So if we're thinking about quadratic functions, right? Uh, what that generally means is okay. Let's fix a house. That's the i term here. J is indexing features. So we have d features, and we're looking at a quadratic function of these d features, which means we'll have d coefficients of our linear terms. X, i, j are just our linear terms, right? Their square footage, their number of bathrooms, whatever. Uh, and w, j, one is just saying we have coefficients for each of those features, and then x i j squared w j two is just saying we're looking also at the squared value of each of our features. x i j squared is just saying look at the number of square feet, square it, and then we'll have a coefficient for that too. Does that make sense? Uh, so we're looking at all the all the linear versions of our features, and then we're taking all of our features and we're squaring them, and we're giving those different weights. Okay. Yeah. And so why so why do you add those together within the sum, the the linear right. and the quadratic term? Right. So uh, we're making an assumption, right? Again, sort of when we pick a model, we're assuming we can do a reasonably good job predicting sale price as a linear function of all these different terms, as a linear function of our original features plus a linear function of their quadratic forms, right? It's a, an assumption we've made that that would be a good representation or a good way to predict sale price from the features we have. Oh, okay, okay, got it, thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, I have a question about the, the maximum likelihood uh, slide, if you could go back. Yeah. Maybe I, I missed this and maybe you already mentioned this. So I understand that, you know, we used le uh, the least likelihood loss function to identify a linear function that can estimate our data. I just, I'm missing the connection of why we're using the maximum, why we're doing this log likelihood. Okay. So that's a good question. And I didn't answer it. I didn't describe that very well. So, so if we want to think about what log likelihood is doing in this case. What we're thinking about is the likelihood of our data given mm -hmm. W and sigma, right? Assuming mm -hmm. that all of our noise is normally distributed. Okay, so what that means is, okay, let's think about the probability or the, um, the, yeah, the probability of our data given a particular W and sigma. We mm -hmm. can write that down in this form. And then we can say, okay, what is the W what is the linear function that actually maximizes the probability of the data that we saw? Mm. Okay. And, and the point is that like, if we think about things in that way, we can then say, okay, how do we find the W which makes our data that we observe most likely? And that's what we did, right? Then, we, then what we did is we saw like, if we actually find that W, that W mm. is equal to the least squares minimizer. So then why is it that, because uh, I'm also coming from like the, the biostats classes, that we were never really taught using this maximum like log likelihood function. We were always taught about like least squares was always enough and you would measure based on this error. So why is it, 
why is it we need to take this extra step then? It's not that we need this extra step. It's just that uh, in general, when you think about the recipe we were talking about earlier, mm -hmm. right? The model we're picking, the loss we're choosing, uh, and then the way we're finding a minimizer or approximate minimizer of that loss, each of those steps, we should ask why we're doing what we're doing. Why yeah. are we choosing a linear model? Why do we think the features we're using are a good enough fit? Uh, and then why did we choose this weird least squares loss function, right? There, we could think about uh, you know, not taking the square, for example, in each of the terms in our loss function, right? Mm -hmm. Wouldn't that be a similarly good loss function? Maybe, maybe not. It depends on what you care about. But the point is that like one of the reasons you might care about, uh, or you might think that least squares is a good representation of a particular problem, uh, and that minimizing it is a good idea, is if it's the case that your error is normally distributed, then W that you find solving these squares is the thing that makes your data most likely. Mm. Right? So it's not, it's not necessary. This was just a point to say that it's generally a good idea to think about why you chose the loss function that you did. And there are many reasons that least squares could be a good idea. This is one. Can you ever, and that makes sense, but can you also just ever have a situation where your least squares, you know, does really, it's very predictive of your data, but you come into a situation where you use log likelihood. So, so uh, let me just back up. So you're showing that going through the log likelihood, the end equation is our least squares, correct? I just want to make sure it's natural. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Then never mind what my question. This makes sense. Great. Cool. Thank you. Um, I have a question about the. I, I just want to mention one thing. It's the log likelihood uh, with Gaussian errors. Yes. If the errors were not Gaussian, if yes. the errors were, say, uh, another distribution like Laplacian, uh, which is just like e to the minus absolute value of x instead of e to the minus x squared over 2, um, which is Gaussian, uh, then you would get a different expression for the log likelihood. And it would not be equal to least squares, and so it's That's it's right. not just uh, that log likelihood, maximizing log likelihood leads to least squares. It's maximizing the log likelihood with Gaussian errors. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Just want to emphasize that. Yeah. Thanks, Kevin. Thank you. Um, I had a question about the quadratic uh, like hypothesis. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> so, like, it had two um, if you look at like the the w matrix it has mm -hmm. two, two columns so That's like right. if if your price was like linear with respect to like square square feet and then like um quadratic with respect to like the data sale and those are like mm -hmm. your only two features mm -hmm. um then like for the like the first row if like that was like for your like linear or whatever like mm -hmm. or for your linear like the first column would be like um would have like the a linear weighting and then you would expect to have zeros on like the second column um, because it's not really quadratic. So so yes, you know, in the in the world if you're if your assumption that uh, the price that is a linear function of square feet and a quadratic function of date of sale and there are no other features which are relevant, uh, you know, if you had enough data <laughs> Or if there was zero sort of error, you would expect that the W you recover by minimizing least squares would have that property, right? It would have some linear weighting on, on square feet, and it would have some non-zero weighting on the squared term of date of sale. Uh, but then there would be, you know, zero or near zero weights on the other features in their quadratic form, right? Um, right. The the optimal function with if you had arbitrarily much data and you had, uh, you know, no error uh, would have that property you mentioned, right? Okay, thank you. Um, so I have questions um, about, about like, it's more about like the variance stuff, like, because um, there's like a reading to the chapter, but so like, I had a question about like, so, um, so one thing that I'm still kind of unclear is like this idea of like bias variance trade-off thing. Um, like, so in one of the derivations in the book, they basically uh, said something like, you know, mean squared error, they decompose into like bias and variance, right? 
And so yeah. like, and and they said there's a trade-off, but like, why can't you just jointly minimize between like, why can't you just jointly minimize them? Like, is there explicitly like you increase this or you decrease this, this goes up? Like, is there like explicitly that, is that something that happens? Yeah, um, yes, sometimes. And we'll talk about that more on Wednesday. Got you. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, so yeah, yeah, that's right. Um, uh, another thing is like, so like um, talking about like consistent estimators versus like unbiased estimators. So, so if I get it correctly, so it's like consistent means like if your number of data samples goes to infinity, like you actually recover the true um, underlying estimator, right? Um, if I, if, are you still there? Hello? Hello? Oh, hello? Uh, I think she just disconnected. She disconnected. Okay, I guess I'll wait. Hi, sorry. I seem to have yeah. lost the internet on my other device. One second. No uh, can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're better. Okay. So uh, I only heard part of your question. So yeah, I'll... yeah. But uh, so, so you were asking about uh, uh, 